three mystical traditions, one tarot deck, and maybe one perennial philosophy. In this video, we'll be looking at the connections between tarot, Kabbalah, Plotinus, and the Mandukya Upanishad. What I will be exploring here is not direct correlation, but interesting resemblance. All of these traditions attempt to point at an ineffable mystery that I just can't get enough of. So let's start with tarot and Kabbalah. If you followed my channel for any amount of time, you know I'm kind of a sucker for Kabbalah. I find that it brings tarot to a much more mystical, philosophical, and even existential scale. And I'll link videos below that teach those connections. But the main idea is that the Kabbalah is a mystical tradition with its origins in Judaism that beautifully builds a bridge between us and the divine. One of its most recognizable technologies is the Tree of Life. The Tree of Life shows how absolute divinity, the source of everything, God, emanates itself in various stages to eventually reach this experience, this physical universe, this moment. This happens through 32 paths. 10 of those paths are sephirot, which are like containers of divinity, and 22 of those paths are the paths that connect those sephirot. The sephirot connect to the minor arcana of the tarot, ace through 10, and the paths connect to the major arcana of the tarot, the fool through the world. The core cards are connected to four letters of the tetragrammaton, which are connected to four of those 10 sephirot. By the way, you can download this holy book for free using the link in the description. What the Tree of Life and the tarot suggest is a creation through a unity entering a duality and a duality becoming multiplicity and eventually this experience now. Keep that in mind because we're gonna see that structure again. Unity, duality, multiplicity in this experience. It has been suggested that a major influence on the Kabbalah was Neoplatonism, which was started by Plotinus. Plotinus's philosophy involves a chain of being. This chain of being kind of looks like a prototypical tree of life. It starts with the one, which is absolute oneness that can't even be described. That pure oneness becomes dual by recognizing itself and emanating into itself. This is known as the noose, or what has been translated as intellectual principle. This is not the rational thinking mind as we normally associate intellect. This is consciousness and being, I guess. The idea here is that being can only exist when the one recognizes itself as being. Because otherwise, what bees unless there's an awareness of the being? When there is no self-recognition or self-awareness, how can anything be? This being further emanates into the soul, which we might connect to our inner world, and then that soul further emanates into nature and the material world. Now remember the structure. Above we have this unity that can't even be described because describing it would create a duality. Below that we have this duality that comes about from self-recognition, and from that self-recognizing duality, that moment of, oh my God, I exist, we get multiplicity, which is the inner world, the soul, and the physical world. This same sort of thing happens with the tree of life. We have complete unity with Keter, the first Sephira, and that emanates into Hokma and Bina. Hokma is wisdom and Bina is understanding. This is our first duality. Bina is like the prism from which the white light of divinity becomes the rainbow of multiplicity. And that rainbow of multiplicity is everything below Bina, starting with Hesed and ending in Malkut, the kingdom, this world. So duality sort of arises between Hokma and Bina, which is the supernal father and the supernal mother, wisdom and understanding. Notice also that in Kabbalah there are four worlds, Ataluth, the archetypal world, Bria, the creative world, Yetzirah, the formative world, and Asaya, the world of action. It seems like it's Bria, the creative world, where being and concept and idea start to exist. Now compare all of this to a tradition maybe thousands of years earlier, the Mandukya Upanishad. The Upanishads are these beautiful glimpses of absolute reality, of absolute divinity, by the rishis. They're kind of like the extra credit of the Vedas, the sacred texts of India, and they are some of the most beautiful things ever written. The Upanishads are like snapshots of enlightenment, literally like enlightened sages showing you and even giving you certain ways to 
unlock that experience, or rather, not experience. The Mandukya Upanishad is the shortest one and some would say the deepest. This Upanishad uses Om as a tool for inquiry into your ultimate true self. The self, Brahman, that mystery, that unitive consciousness which is talked about in almost every line of the Upanishads is kind of the destination, even though there is no destination. The way that the Upanishads attempts to offer this truth is by analyzing three common experiences. The first experience is the waking state, what you're watching right now. The second experience is the dream world and the inner world. The third common experience is deep sleep. And the fourth, which translates from the word Turiya, is that which we are all trying to know, which is what we truly are, that infinite conscious self, truth, Brahman, existence, consciousness, bliss. Now, this system is not a ladder of emanation like Plotinus or the Kabbalah, but there are some interesting similarities. Notice how this system uses four experiences. Well, one ultimate truth and then three experiences that exist within that ultimate truth. The ultimate truth is Brahman, which you know we really can't say anything about because it is everything, or rather it alone exists, if you take an Advaita Vedantin interpretation. But within Brahman, there are the experiences of deep sleep, and then dreamer in the dreamer's world, and then waker in the waker's world. Notice how in the dream state and the waking state, there is a subject and an object. In the dream state, there is you and an external world, both in the dream state. In the waker's world, there is you and everything external to you. But in the deep sleep state, there is no subject and object, or at least not the experience of them. There exists the seeds of duality, and those seeds of duality become the subject and object of the dream world and the waker's world. Through the Mandukya method, we go from the duality of the waker's world to the duality of the dream world to the seeds of the duality in the dream world, and when we release that, when we go to that next level, the idea is we realize that all three of those experiences exist in a non-dual truth, Brahman, Turiya, existence, consciousness, bliss. I can't help but notice a resemblance between the deep sleep world and the Mandukya Upanishads, which has seeds of duality, with Plotinus's intellectual principle, with the Kabbalistic Hokma and Bina. Let's read some quotes. The Mandukya Upanishad says of the deep sleep state, the state is deep sleep, where the sleeper does not desire any enjoyable thing and does not see any dream. The third quarter is Pragya, who has deep sleep as his sphere, in whom everything becomes undifferentiated, who is a mass of mere consciousness, who abounds in bliss, who is surely an enjoyer of bliss, and who is the doorway to the experience of the dream and the waking states. In the same way, Bina in the Tree of Life represents this two-way door. In this two-way door, there's a birth and a death. Going downwards into manifestation, there's a death of unity for the birth of duality. But going upwards in the mystical ascent, there's a death of duality and a birth of unity. Now, consider Bina's attribution of Saturn when I read Plotinus's quote on the intellectual principle. Plotinus says, the archetypal world is the true age of Kronos, whose very name suggests abundance and intellect. Did you catch that? He said Kronos. Kronos is the god of time associated with Saturn. For here is contained all that is immortal. Nothing here but is divine mind. All is God. This is the place of every soul. Here is rest unbroken. Consider those words, rest unbroken with deep sleep. And how he says, for here, all is contained that is immortal in deep sleep, in Pragya, in Ishvara, we're looking at something that is all contained, pure, the, the mass of consciousness all contained within itself. He says, for how can that seek change in which all is well? Its knowing is not by search, but by possession. Its blessedness inherent, not acquired. For all belong to it eternally, and it holds the authentic eternity imitated by time. So he mentions time. Time requires duality. Time and duality are the waking state and the dream state, but time starts to dissolve into eternity in the deep sleep state. That is beautifully mapped out in the Tree of Life with Bina's association to Saturn, being the planet of time and limitation. Plotinus says, intellective principle by its intellective act establishes being, 
which in turn, as the object of intellection, becomes the cause of intellection and of existence to the intellectual principle. Though when we look at these similarities, it allows us to view tarot as not just a tool for divination, but existential self-reflection. Tarot then becomes a tool of mystical philosophy and even ascent and potentially enlightenment. If you're interested in this level of work with tarot or mystical philosophy, you can find more information and free classes at tarotmysticismacademy.com. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next wormhole. Much love.